Hello and welcome to the Hoover Institution's 2014 Fall Retreat. I'm Chris Dower, Hoover's Director of Marketing and Strategic Communications. Our speaker in this chart cast is Morris Fiorina, a senior fellow at the Hoover Institution and the Wendt Family Professor of Political Science at Stanford University. The title of his talk is The U.S. Electorate, Shifting Majorities, Polarization, and the 2014 Elections. It was recorded on October 20th, 2014. And thank you all for coming out at this time slot. Every professor knows that this is the worst time slot of the day to give a lecture. <laughs> and uh, so if you find yourself dozing off, don't feel bad, because we see your children and grandchildren do it all the time. <laughs> okay. I'm going to give a kind of meandering talk today. And it's not that I haven't thought harder about organizing it. It's just that our politics has been meandering uh, for the last decade or so. And I think my remarks reflect that. First, the, the whole question of unstable majorities, uh, part of my title. In 2004, the Republicans captured all three elective branches of government. And then in 2006, they got thumped and lost uh, the Congress. Then in 2008, the Democrats captured all three elected branches of government. In 2010, uh, they got shellacked in Barack Obama's term, uh, losing 63 seats in the House, the biggest midterm loss since 1938. Uh, 2012, we had the same uh, pattern of government, uh, partly because the Republicans did such a bad job of choosing Senate candidates in the two previous elections. Uh, and then 2014, we could very well be looking at a fifth pattern of government in six uh, elections. I wondered just how common or uncommon this idea of alternating majorities was in American history. It turns out you have to go back a century and a quarter to find anything like this, this kind of macro instability we're seeing in recent elections that uh, the last quarter of the 19th century was the last time we saw anything like this. The entire 20th century, we didn't have any kind of shifting majorities like this. Now I'll come back to that period uh, at the end of my talk today. The, uh, the most common explanation for what's going on is the polarization narrative that's been advanced uh, for a long time now. And the idea is the country is deeply divided. Uh, there are almost the same number of electoral votes in the red and the blue states. There's a small number of people who are variously described as clueless or wishy-washy who decide elections. Uh, a somewhat older version of this uh, graphic of this situation is right here. Uh -huh. okay. yeah. I have spent the last 10 years talking to politicos and journalists and explaining why this argument is wrong. Polarization is a very simple concept. Uh, it simply means the middle uh, declines and the extremes grow. So at time one, for example, if we're talking about ideological polarization, we have an even distribution of liberals, moderates, and conservatives. And at time two, the moderates are gone. And everybody is either a liberal or a conservative. That would be ideological polarization. If we think of polarization in partisan terms, at time one, we have an even distribution of Democrats, independents, and Republicans. And at time two, the independents are gone. Everybody's either a Democrat or a Republican. Uh, nothing like this has occurred. There are big academic databases on all these sort of uh, measures, and they show uh, quite the opposite. That if we look at people's self-identified ideology, the General Social Survey has been tracking that since 1974, and we see just basically flat lines. Uh, moderates uh, are more often than not the, uh, the single most uh, uh, frequent category, uh, liberals traditionally the least uh, frequent category, and conservatives the red line in between sort of around 35% of the country, and no trend, simply no trend at all. If we think of, part of uh, polarization in terms of um, party identification, what people think of themselves as, uh, we find quite the opposite. In fact, independents have grown over time. Uh, we see a situation where the Democrats lost severely in the troubles of the 60s and early 70s. Uh, but since the Reagan administration, the distribution of party identification in this country has been just about stable. The uh, moderates or the independents are uh, somewhere in the 30s, typically. Uh, the um, Democrats are a little higher and the Republicans a little lower. The uh, Republicans didn't gain as independents as Democrats lost. We don't have as long a time series on individual issues because they come and go. Uh, but to the extent we have, again, we see a non-polarized distribution. We ask people in the national election studies, which we, we conduct here, um, a whole series of issue questions where they give them, we give them seven-point scales, where the leftmost 
response is liberal and the rightmost response is conservative. So on health insurance, for example, the red line, the leftmost response is single payer and the rightmost response is leave everything to private insurance. And as you can see, basically people clump up in the center. They're neither uh, all free marketeers or all central planners. They like sort of a mixed idea. The American population is just not ideological. Now what has happened? We all know something important has happened in American politics. What it is is a process that's more complicated than polarization. And it's what political scientists call party sorting. And to illustrate that, what we have here, uh, time one, say think about 1960, uh, we have the Democrats being a left of center party but with a significant moderate wing and even a conservative wing. And we see the Republicans as being a right of center party but with a moderate wing and even a significant liberal wing. By the way, it's, it's just really nice to talk to an audience like this where you actually remember conservative Democrats and liberal Republicans. Uh, uh, yeah. our, our freshmen, the ones I teach this year, were born in 1996. Yeah. They, they are puzzled that Hillary Clinton's husband gets as much publicity as he does. You know, just, so I mean, the, 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 the things have changed dramatically in our lifetime. Now at time two, we've seen sorting occur. That the Democrats have lost their conservative wing. Uh, either they were driven out, or they died off, or they left of their own accord. And similarly for Republicans, they've lost their liberal wing. So now we have a pronounced left of center party on the Democratic side and a pronounced right of center party on the Republican side. But notice the middle hasn't gone anywhere. There are just as many moderates as before, only they simply have no home in either party. And they are an outvoted minority in either party. That's what has occurred. And just to illustrate this, there are limits to the sorting. I mean, clearly voters in the, out there, Republicans and Democrats, are, are distinct. But take an issue that's really been one of the touchstone issues between the parties in recent, uh, recent decades, abortion. When should it be permitted? This is not just a comparison of strong Democrats, of, of Democrats and Republicans, but it's the people who consider themselves strong Democrats and strong Republicans. That's about one-eighth of the population for Republicans, one-sixth of the population for Democrats. You probably would be surprised, I mean, there's a dramatic difference, of course, but you might be surprised that about a quarter of the strong Democrats are arguably pro-life. 9% saying never allowed, and another 17% say only in the most serious uh, circumstances. And you might be surprised, given what you read, that basically about a third of the strong Republicans are pro-choice. 21% says always as a personal choice, and 15% take the sort of wishy-washy uh, anytime there's a clear need. So even on the most, the issues that most clearly divide the parties, the sorting is still very imperfect. The sorting increases as political commitment increases. That is, the more involved you are in politics, the more likely is a Democrat and a Republican to be different from each other. Uh, the bottom line, the dashed line, are just ordinary party identifiers, Democrats and Republicans out there in the electorate. And you can see they start out about one ideological unit apart and increase. The middle line, broken line, are party activists, and people who knock on doors and distribute literature and put signs on their lawns and so forth. And they are more polarized and getting even more so. And the top line is contributors, people who actually give money. And this is where a lot of the polarization in politics comes from. There's a great deal of uh, new research on con uh, contributing. And uh, it shows that basically donors are the most polarized people in the system. Uh, this, is a, uh, this is a comparison in the, from what we call the comparative, never mind. Uh, it's a big, big survey, 30 some thousand people. And uh, on the left we see what people who don't donate money, their ideological positions. It is skewed left, but it's basically unimodal. And then we see that whether you're a big donor or a small donor, it really doesn't matter. They're highly polarized distributions. The donors tend to be either on the left or either on the right. The ones at the center, by the way, just tend to be more business type groups who are just donating for access rather than to elect the candidates they like. The um, outside spending is something you read about all the time in the aftermath of Citizens United and the super PACs and 527s, et cetera. And it's clearly a major development. It's important. You can see how rapidly outside spending is increasing. And the significance of it is it nationalizes elections. That it, it might be that the two candidates in Mississippi don't want to talk about the same, candidate, same issues as the two candidates in, in, say, Massachusetts. But with outside groups pouring in the money, they push their issues onto the agenda. And so we tend to have the election being fought on the same sorts of issues all around the country. A generation ago, most of the funding for congressional campaigns came from individual donations within the district. Now it's very much a, a national sort of part, party uh, money race for the parties. 
What has been happening, I think, in the recent decades that accounts for the ping-ponging back and forth is what I call political overreach. And this is not a normative term. It simply means that once you're in office, you govern in a way that alienates the marginal members of your coalition. That you run on one basis and you, you govern on another basis. And some of the people who voted for you are unhappy about the way you're governing. It's certainly not something new. I mean, Lyndon Johnson is a classic example. In the aftermath, very special circumstances, the Kennedy assassination, the landslide victory, uh, they passed a huge amount of legislation, arguably went much farther than the country would have liked. The result was a slap down in the 1966 election and the election of Richard uh, Nixon in 1968. Bill Clinton in 92 ran as a more or less conservative Democrat, conservative moderate, and then veered sharply left his first two years in office. And again, the Republicans took over Congress in 1994. Newt Gingrich then proceeded to overreach, uh, shut down the government, and he managed to reelect Bill Clinton. Um, we've seen the same thing happen with uh, Bush, with Obama. Uh, Bush, uh, when he was reelected, fairly narrow margin, says, I learned I earned capital in the campaign, political capital, and now I intend to spend it. And things didn't work out so well in 2006. A lot of people didn't realize they had voted to, uh, pers for personal social security accounts or to spread uh, democracy around the world and nation build. And in his memoirs, uh, President Bush says, well, I, I may have misread the electoral mandate. Uh, the American people don't give mandates. The American people put you on probation. They say, we'll give you two years, four years, and we'll see how you do. So it's a, the whole concept of a mandate is one of the great myths of American politics. The, um, Barack Obama, I'll come to in a moment, is a case study in overreach. The, uh, the overreach is becoming more frequent, I think, for three reasons. Uh, the first is, as the party bases have become more homogeneous, their pressures are coming all from one side. So when you have a Democratic president in office, all the pressures are coming from groups like the net roots and so forth. They can't play off liberals and conservatives against each other. Same thing for the Republicans. A second thing, a second reason is that, um, is that since majorities have become so fleeting, I think there's a tendency to say, we better strike while the iron is hot, that we may never get another chance to do health care or whatever. And so they do that. And the third thing, more, much more impressionistic, I've talked to, put to uh, very active people on both sides, is a kind of self-delusion. That if you uh, associate only with people who sort of share your political sentiments, you get a very sort of biased view of what the American public really thinks. So I think the overreach has just become endemic in today's politics. Again, coming back to um, Barack Obama, uh, we remember all the promises that were made in the various speeches and during the campaign. I think they'd be much happier if they had cut all the things after the semicolon and just put a period uh, on that. The, uh, yeah. You just don't want to set the expectation, set the bar too high uh, when you're in politics. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and it's, it's not only the extremity of their positions that is a co component of overreach. The other component is their priorities. In, in the 2012 uh, campaign, or 2008 campaign, it wasn't about health care. That was a middling issue. It wasn't about cap and trade. It was about jobs and the economy, but this is clearly what the, the administration focused on was cap and trade and health care in the first two years. Again, reflecting, I think, the pressures of the base. That, um, and he didn't learn. I mean, the, the cartoon Obama here uh, learns a lesson, but the real Obama didn't. Uh, this is his uh, description of his 2012 inaugural address. Uh, we don't let our students use Wikipedia, but it's actually pretty good uh, for a lot of things. Uh, the, the emphasis here, climate change, immigration reform, and gun control. Well, these were indeed uh, issues that were very important to the Democratic base. But the Pew Foundation, a very reputable uh, polling uh, firm, two weeks before this inaugural address had conducted a poll in the country in which they asked the American public, what do you think should be the most important priorities for Congress and the President to work on during the coming year? And uh, this is what they said. They're worried about their jobs in the economy, uh, their Social Security, their kids' education, Medicare, health care costs, incidentally not, not access, but costs, crime, environment. And here are the less important issues. There's immigration coming in at number 17 there on the list. Uh, guns coming in at number 18. This is one month after Sandy Hook. And so guns are still number 18 in priorities. And dead last is global warming. Now, I'm not saying what people should be focused on. That's not my job as an analyst. All I'm saying is there's a big disconnect between what the American people wanted the political system to be focusing on and what the political system, the Obama administration, actually was focusing on. A bit of a digression. Uh, about a year ago, I suggested to the people running the Hoover poll 
they put a version of this Pew uh, poll on for California just to see what California priorities are. And I, I assumed they would be quite a lot different from national priorities given the po political complexion of California. In fact, they weren't. Um, if, this is the top priorities of all the California uh, respondents. And okay, illegal immigration comes up a little higher um, because of you know, obvious reasons for California. And then here are the low ones. And there again, we come in with global warning, thir third from the bottom, uh, gun laws, second from the bottom, and only the high-speed rail um, project uh, saved those from being the two, uh, <laughs> the two least issues that deserve least priority. So Californians really aren't that different, that, that the bulk of the American population out there, the people who aren't active in politics, who aren't donating money, uh, who don't sort of go to the tiny fraction, who actually go to the websites and listen to the podcasts, et cetera, that large group is concerned about bread and butter issues. They're concerned about their quality of life, their jobs, their kids' educations, their health care, and so forth. And the political system is not responding to those for the most part. Now, independence, let's talk about them. It's a big category, but it's not at all homogeneous. Uh, there are, sure, a large number of ideological centrists. Every time I see David Gergen on TV, I think the guy is trying to go right down the middle uh, on everything. They're also inconsistent. Uh, I talk to a lot of Stanford students who will say they, they understand the problems, the, un, the unsustainability of entitlements, et cetera, but they can't bring themselves to vote for a party whose platform is basically being tough on gays and outlawing abortion. That they, they're, they're caught between the parties. They don't have the right alternatives. There are people who are just alienated from both. These tend to be the fringe groups like those who socialists and others. And there are the indifferent who just really don't think politics has any bearing on their lives. So it's a big category, but the important thing is they're volatile. They're not aligned. They'll be switching back and forth. And here's how independents vote in the presidential elections uh, since 1952 when the survey began. And I believe this is 16 elections. And as you can see, basically the party that carries the independents wins the election. That's the, the line is, the horizontal line is 50%. There are three exceptions to that uh, generalization. 1960 and 1976 were terribly close elections, of course, and that was also in the era when there were a lot more Democrats. So the Democrats didn't need independence as much. The Republicans always needed independence more than Democrats did because Republicans were the smaller party. And then the last occurrence of this was seen as 2004, when the Republicans had a very good turnout operation and managed to win basically by rallying the base, and uh, even though they lost the independent category. In House elections, it's even more striking. Uh, Ronald Reagan, when he came into office, he gained 33 seats. He carried the independents 60 to 40. In 1994, when Bill Clinton was slapped down, uh, the Republicans carried the independents about uh, even more than that, 65 to 35. In the last two elections, give you whiplash. It basically, the independents swung 17% against the Republicans in 2006. Then they turned around and hammered the, the, uh, the Democrats 18% in, 19, uh, in uh, 2010. So we had a 35% swing among the independents in those two elections. And their numbers are increasing. Far from the country polarizing along partisan lines, which you see uh, often, uh, their numbers are going up. And in fact, the last Gallup poll, which was conducted a month ago, had the independents at 47%. And I'm not sure that that could be just some fluctuating, some, some, uh, some sample fluctuation. But nevertheless, the number of people or the proportion of the electorate that is just dissatisfied with both parties is at a high since we've been gathering data from the mid-20th century. The story of the political deterioration of the Obama administration is, can be seen in tracking the independents. Uh, he starts out with a 60 to 20 uh, approval majority among independents, 20% um, holding their fire. They're not sure just what they got when they elected him. And you can see in the first year, he loses them. By the end of the first year, he's underwater among independents that more disapprove of Obama than approve and has continued to the present time. In 2012, Obama was reelected by a margin smaller than his earlier margin, which is very unusual, politically speaking. Generally, the reelection victories, think Nixon, think Reagan, uh, et cetera, think Clinton. They're bigger in their second uh, term. But that wasn't the case, and in fact, he lost among independents. Not enough to lose the election, but these are all the key states that were at issue in 2012. And you can see in all but North Carolina, I believe, yes, uh, his proportion among the independents went down. So the, the Democratic coalition was being reduced to its core elements in these elections. Which brings us to the present uh, era. We are in a new era, basically from the one that most of us have grown up in, that uh, we grew up from the 60s to the 90s. Uh, which was an era with, when tip, 
Tip O'Neill had this comment that all politics is local. And that was true during his era. This was true, this was the era in which you had conservative Democrats, liberal Republicans, a big incumbency advantage that didn't matter what happened in presidential elections, the Democrats just continued to win the House of, of, uh, House of Representatives. And that turns out, historically speaking, to be the anomalous situation. Uh, it was true during the pre-Civil War days when we didn't even have elections on the same day or the same month in many cases. And it was true during this period. Instead, we're now in a nationalized era in which, uh, which is basically more common, the latter part of the 19th century, the New Deal period, and the present era, in which people vote on the basis of national issues and national candidates, that there's not much difference. They're not splitting their tickets much. And just to give an example of one indicator, this graph depicts the proportion of congressional districts, House districts, that voted for the presidential candidate of one party and the congressional candidate of the other party. So split majorities in the districts. As you can see in this mid 20th century period, mid to late 20th century period, those numbers often reach to 45%. And this is those two high, those two peaks are Nixon's and Reagan's re-election when a lot of people voted for the Republican presidential candidate and the Democratic congressional candidate. And then it began a precipitous drop to the present era, whereas in the last election, only 5% of the congressional districts voted differently for those two, uh, two offices. Now think about the incentive effects this has. If Tip O'Neill came to the Democratic Caucus in 1985 and said, I want to oppose Reagan on this, there were 113 Democrats who said, oh, let's be careful, Tip, he carried my district. If Boehner comes to the Republican Caucus nowadays and says, I want to oppose Obama on this, there are only 16 Republicans who have any problem with that. Their districts voted for them and for Romney in the last elections. So the incentives to sort of hang tough and obstruct are much greater now than they would have been to compromise and to go across party lines, just as a reflection of the fact that the, the voting has become so much more homogeneous. The, one of the real indicators that sort of makes political scientists' eyes uh, leap is this uh, graph, which is a little more complicated. But if you had, to put it this way, if you had a choice, you wanted to predict a congressional candidate's margin in this election. And you had two pieces of information. One was how that person did in the last election, and the other was how the president did in that district in the last election. Well, I think most of us would say, well, of course we want to know how the person did in the last election because that's the same candidate running with the same issue stands and so forth. And that was certainly true for five decades, uh, starting from when we have data again. The personal vote maps the importance of the, your own margin in the previous election. The presidential vote graph, the dotted lines, maps the, proportion, uh, the importance of the presidential vote. As you can see, they crossed for the first time in 2006. And it was a big difference in 2010. So now, in the last two elections, it's been more important to know how the president did in your district the last time than how you did. So that's an indication of how incumbency has become much weaker, how your personal stands have become much weaker, and how the national picture, the national issues and the national candidates have become much stronger. We are looking at, for the first time since 1990, a fairly normal midterm in the House. A normal midterm is basically the party the president loses seats. In 1994, uh, we had the Republican takeover, a wave election. In 1998, uh, despite this generalization that the presidential party loses seats, uh, the Democrats managed to gain seats when the Republicans doubled down on the Lewinsky scandal uh, late in the campaign. In 2010, the Republicans, the incumbent party, gained seats in the aftermath of 9-11 and some very unwise political positioning by the Democrats. In 2006, we had another wave election, the thumping. In 2010, another wave election, the shellacking. This one looks pretty normal, that I don't know of anyone who has any model who's doing any polling who expects anything more than single digit losses for the, uh, I mean, basically you could go somewhere between five and 12 seats losses for the Democrats in this election. It's, it's not gonna be a wave in part because the Republicans already control so many seats. There's just not that much more marginal territory for the Republicans to take. Uh, our colleague, Doug Rivers, is the president of YouGov Polymetrics, which is a big, uh, big uh, internet polling firm. And he's doing the polling for CBS News, New York Times at uh, this time. And they're oversampling the competitive states and they're, they're sampling in all of the, uh, the Senate races and the House races. And th these are Doug's probability estimates based on their surveys. And essentially, the, the, the Democrats have about a something under 5% chance of taking the House. And he, realistically, it's, it's probably even less. I, I just don't know anybody who wouldn't bet the House on the Republican, no pun, on the House uh, going uh, Republican. 
Uh, Senate's like everybody else, whether you go to the Washington Post or New York Times or any polls, that it's just so close to call. And Doug's basically giving it to the Reds. These are the probabilities of a given number of seats after the election. And Doug's basically saying there's just a slightly greater chance than 50% uh, of the Democrats, of the Republic, Republicans gaining the Senate in the last election. It's very close. And uh, this, this is his data from a month ago, uh, his, his portrayal. And I called him this weekend just to see about changes. And he says, well, he says, Kansas has clearly slipped some, but he still thinks their polling shows Kansas going Republican. Colorado has clearly slipped some, but he thinks their polling still shows that Colorado will likely go Democratic. So it's basically, you know, everybody's sort of expecting this is going to be really close. The, the, probably if you had to bet, you'd want to bet the Republicans will win control, but it's going to be by a very narrow margin. And there's a good probability. There's enough, there are enough close races that last minute things, uh, gaffes, et cetera, and there have been some, they, they keep doing it. Um, that they could still change the, uh, change the outcome here. Doug's polling on Obama is very interesting. Um, if you say, uh, is Obama a factor in your vote? Republicans all say, oh yeah, you know, it's gonna be a national election, it's all about Obama. And Democrats say, no, nothing to see here, move on folks, this is, all about, uh, this is all about local elections, local candidates, and so forth. These are massive differences between Republicans and Democrats. You've probably read about how Republicans are more enthusiastic than Democrats uh, in uh, this uh, current election. And that's true, um, everyone, you know, all these are battleground states, Doug shows, and the country as a whole at the bottom, uh, Doug shows that the Republicans are more enthusiastic, but not by much. Uh, the gap was smaller in 2010. Uh, so it's a, in ter terms of to comparing to 2010, it's kind of a weak, uh, weak reflection of that. I'd like to conclude by going back to this 19th century period because I think there are a lot of parallels between uh, then and now. This was a period of t basically 20 years of electoral chaos that the Republicans and Democrats each won the presidential popular vote six times, although the asterisks indicate that the Republicans won in the Electoral College uh, twice even though they lost the popular vote. The House was more often than not Democratic. Uh, the Senate was more often than not Republican, although it was actually tied, that's where the asterisk is. And there were only, in, in 22 years, there were only two elections, two year periods, in which one party controlled everything, the Republicans in 1880 and the Democrats in 1892. So these, these periods of chaos can go on, historically speaking, quite a long time. If, if, if this is any uh, indication of what we're doing now, we're halfway through, basically, what could be another 10 years of chaos. They tend to end, they tend to end when one party wins big. And people say, okay, that's it. You know, and that party governs successfully and cements that majority in for a while. But you have to have a party have a win big and have a really successful uh, administration, which we haven't had in recent years. There are a lot of historical similarities if you read the historiography of the period. Uh, it was a period of great economic transformation, uh, the, electro the uh, Industrial Revolution uh, in this country. Uh, now people say we're in, we're in the midst of another transformation. They call it a communications revolution or an informational revolution or what have you. But clearly things are changing. The economy is changing in a, in a very big way. Okay. Uh, then and now, uh, globalization. Now we, we hear it all the time now, globalization. But even then, uh, the, um, the British finance built the American Railroad several times over. Uh, American Midwestern farmers were shipping grain to, to uh, Europe and competing with the Russians and the Ukrainians and international grain markets. Uh, a lot going on. Population movement. Uh, then it was from the farms to the cities. More recently it's been from the Frost Belt to the Sun Belt, changing the political uh, position in the United States. Mass immigration, uh, even more, uh, more so in those days than today. And rising economic inequality. Now, when you have major social and economic developments like this, they create problems, and government is responsible for trying to solve those problems. And they create issues that fracture old coalitions, that you've been together with one group for a long time, but suddenly this new issue you have different views on. Uh, young political entrepreneurs can see a way to split old coalitions, construct new coalitions if they take positions in certain ways. And when these kinds of changes come cumulatively at the same time as they did then, as I think they do now, they really create this unstable political situation where we have two parties which offer you two alternatives and there are a lot more alternatives out there than that. 
And uh, some of my colleagues are so dismayed by the present situation, they've sort of given up on American institutions. They, they say we need to abolish the filibuster, redistrict districts in various ways, or even go to a parliamentary system or something like that. And I don't think institutions are the answer here. This is a graph um, my colleague, whom you know, Dave Brady, put together uh, recently. And this compares uh, various kinds of economic uh, indicators in the U.S. with those in the European area who have a lot of these other institutions with the G20 nations, the advanced democracies. And as you can see, one after another, the U.S. is doing, in general, at least as well off or better than any of these things, than any of these countries. The, the, the problem is not institutions. The problem is simply that um, democratic governments, indeed all governments, do well when they're giving things away. When you're giving things to people, uh, people like you, and they think your government's efficient and doing a good job. When you're taking things away, governments have trouble. And we're in an era where governments are being told they have to take things away in terms of entitlements in the U.S. In terms of, and around the world. That we're in an era of scarcity and it appears some stagnation. And so it doesn't matter what kind of institutions you have, people are going to be unhappy when governments take action uh, in this direction. I think the, the problem actually concerns me more today than in the late 19th century. At least then, we were in an era of growth. We did have all these problems, but the economy was booming. It was growing in many ways. And so we were in that expansive era. And also, in foreign affairs in that time, we could free ride on the Brits. They could still take care of everything. Whereas now, we're in an era of stagnation. And when it comes to international affairs, it's on us, basically, as far as the rest of the world uh, sees that. So I, I think, if anything, I'm more concerned about the, uh, about the possibility of the future uh, as I am um, as I would have been, or whatever. Um, and don't ask me any questions about how to improve it because I don't have any answers. Uh, that's, I, I'm concerned, but uh, I don't have the answers. For more podcasts from the Hoover Institution, please visit hoover.org or Hoover's channels on either iTunes U or SoundCloud. I'm Chris Dower for the Hoover Institution. Thanks for listening.